And uh, then I'll give you a little bit of definition about Pentecost. We'll talk about that. And uh, I've given you a new icon today. Uh, there's a little blue sort of a s triangle that says first. Whenever we come across something new uh, for the first time in the book of Acts, I'm going to give you that icon and then put it out to the side. So we'll come to that today. And the rest of this, if you want to, you can look at it later. But you can also turn to the back page. That's what we'll be looking at mostly today as we go through some of these things. So I'm going to put that on the side there, and I'll get other ones to you later. But we continue this morning with Acts, God's unfinished book, Pentecost, the promise fulfilled. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful passage as we, um, as we come into this uh, this morning. We'll finish up with chapter 1, then move on into this first part of chapter 2. Jesus, at this point, has left his disciples. There, he's gone. He's gone. He hasn't... Uh, disappeared suddenly. This is the uh, this is the the end of midway through chapter one, near the, going towards the end of chapter one. He's gone. He's left them, and he by the way he has left, he has shown them he's not coming back. He hasn't just disappeared. He has risen into heaven up through the skies. They're looking at him until finally he disappears in the clouds. The Bible says very clearly this is how he's going to return one day, not the rapture, which is the secret getting the secret calling away of the church. At some point, and we different people believe the raptures at different times. That's not the coming of Jesus again. That um, that that is mirrored here, but it will be at the end of the tribulation. The Bible's very clear. Jesus, the angels say, the same manner that you see him left, Jesus is going to come again. And so one day, there will be a physical, seen return, a visible return of Jesus to the earth. He will come in the clouds, and his foot, the Bible says, it will touch earth. Not symbolically, not spiritually, in a spiritual whatever, his foot will touch the earth on the Mount of Olives. That's where he left. That's where he's going to come back. And the Bible says, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful passage speaking of the end times, that the, that the Mount of Olives will, will split at that time. And you can read that. That's in your notes. Uh, that's in your, in your notes that you received earlier in another week. And you can go back and you say, what is that? Where is that? That means you didn't do your homework. You've got to go back and check your notes. So that's for, you to, that's for you to check. So Jesus is gone, but he leaves them three commands. Okay? What are the three commands? What's the first command? First command is, look at your notes. What's the first command? Go. Okay? So the first command is go. Go where? Not go away, but go where? Into all the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Teaching them, baptizing them, teaching them to obey. It's not just enough to say, oh, here's the good news about Jesus. True discipleship is shown in an obedient life to God. In an obedient, they, you hear the word, lives are transformed. A lot of people just, oh yeah, I want to hear the good news. But part of being a disciple of Jesus is that our lives are changed and transformed. We begin to obey what the Bible says. Our lives begin to look like the life of Jesus. That's what it is to be a disciple. And Jesus says, go out and do that in the world. So the first command is go. The second command is what? Stay. Now, if you were teaching a dog those commands, that would be really confusing, wouldn't it? Go. Stay. <laughs> so he tells his disciples, stay. They've been commissioned, but he wants them to stay where? In Jerusalem. Very specifically. Stay in Jerusalem. Why does he want them to stay, even though he's told them to go? Okay, for the promise. They're not yet ready. They've been commissioned, but they're not yet equipped to fill out the commission. And so he says, stay in Jerusalem until you receive what the Father has promised. By the way, when the word stay, when Jesus uses, when he says stay in Jerusalem, in the original language, that phrase, that expression means literally stick to one spot, as if you were glued to one spot and you could not move. That's, that's exactly what it means when Jesus says that. So the second command is stay in Jerusalem. And then the third command is what? Receive. Receive. What does he want them to receive? What is it? The gift 
of the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when they receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, along with that, they will also receive what? Power. They will receive power. So three commands, go, stay, receive. And all of those are part of the direction and the command of Jesus to his disciples. He wants them, this is important. Brothers and sisters, your salvation, listen, we, we look at this and we think, oh, this is 2,000 years ago. Your salvation this morning, my salvation this morning, depended on these disciples doing what Jesus said to do. Go, stay, receive. It depended on them. Because if they didn't get it right in the very beginning, you and I would not have received the gospel of God in power that has changed our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. And even today when he calls us to go, he still wants us to be equipped and prepared in the same way. We have the truth. We have the words. We have the knowledge. But that is not enough to fully transform a life. It requires the power, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. He must do that. And so what he says to them, he says to us as well. And so the disciples return to Jerusalem. And what do they do? The next slide. We talked about this last time. They all met together. were constantly united in prayer. We'll look at this a little bit more in just a minute. But they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They went back to Jerusalem and they met constantly in prayer. Can you imagine what their prayer was like? Can you think about some of the feelings and some of the words? Imagine that. Imagine that. Jesus, you promised. Oh, you promised. Father, send us the Holy Spirit. Send us, baptize, send us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's, that's what they prayed as they waited on the Lord. Now, they did one other thing, okay? What's one other thing? Now, you can look now at your old handouts and your new handouts, and we'll come to that. The second thing, the only other thing they do besides prayer, let's go ahead and look at the next passage. The only other thing they do is they take care of one order of business. They have to replace Judas. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because what a terrible subject, right? Imagine that. One well, it wasn't only one poor decision. It was more than one poor decision. But he, Judas, was called just as Peter was, just as John was, just as Andrew was, all of them. And yet, look how Judas ends. Even today, even today, if you say to somebody, you're a Judas, everybody knows what that means, right? You're a betrayer. If somebody says, oh, it's the kiss of Judas, we know what that means as well. What a terrible, what, a, what an awful um, heritage and what an awful memory of his name. I want us to look at one thing, and we're going to look at a couple of things here, but I want us to look first. Uh, if, you, if you read the Bible a fair bit, then you will say, okay, here's the news. This is Peter talking, and he talks about the death of Judas. But if you read in Matthew 27, um, let me make sure I'm giving you the right reference. Yep. If you read in Matthew 27, something different is described about the death of Judas. Okay? Here it says that Judas falls head first and his body splits open. That's awfully graphic, isn't it? As we think about it. And spilling out his intestines. That's really graphic. Um, but that's, that's what sin and death did in the life of Judas. But if you read Matthew 27, it's something different. What does Matthew 27 tell us about how Judas died? He hanged himself. He committed suicide, so he hanged himself. How do we reconcile the two? He hanged himself, but now if he hanged himself, how did he buy a field with the money he received and then he was buried? I, how do you put those two together? It doesn't fit. I think it can fit together. And for some of you who say, well, I've never thought about that before, I'm sure there are some of you that said, I've thought about that before and I haven't quite figured it out. How it could fit together, one explanation would be, as you look at the two, if you'll remember from Matthew 27, Judas did not repent, but he regretted what he did. He took the money, 30 pieces of silver, back to the priest, and he said, take it back. And the priest said, no, we don't take money. It's, and the priest themselves said, this is money for murder. That's what, it, that's what it's recorded. They knew what they had done. And he throws the money in the temple. He goes out. He hangs himself. 
But the priest didn't take the money back. That was Judas's money. And so when you look at that and you look at this, the priests take the money. It's Judas's money. And so in effect, Judas purchases the field. It is his money that purchases the field. And so we can reconcile it in that way. And what we can look at is this. He hangs himself. It is a, it is a hot climate. And either the rope broke or he was cut down. And because of the heat and the climate, his body was decomposing. And as he fell, then the body split open. That's probably the best way to reconcile these two things. But it, and some of you say, well, I never thought about that, or, or that doesn't bother me. But, you know, this is God's Word, and God's Word fits together. It does. God word, God's Word fits together in the right way. So we see this, but I want us to look at one other thing as we consider this. This is the very beginning of the church, and I want you to think about the disciples for just a minute, because this was a great betrayal, not only of Jesus, but of all of the disciples as well. They were close. They had worked together, lived together, eaten together, slept all in one place together, had left everything together to follow Jesus for about three years. And Judas, when he betrayed Jesus, he betrayed them all. He betrayed them all. This had the power in the very beginning to completely derail, to completely mess up the beginning of the church. And you might say, well, Pastor Jennifer, you're being a little dramatic. I don't think so. Have you ever met Christians that got so messed up by some other Christian? They failed me. They lied to me. They betrayed me. I thought they were going to make it. And look, they have fallen by the wayside. And then they themselves get messed up too in their Christian walk because of another Christian, because of somebody else in the church. Have you ever met somebody else like that? I have. I've met people who have walked away from God and walked away from the church because somebody else in the church blew it and messed up. Brothers and sisters, learn something from this very first passage in the book of Acts. Learn to grow up in your Christian faith. Don't get mad at me. Learn to grow up in your Christian faith and learn what the disciples did. Keep on going. If somebody else fails, they failed. If somebody else hurts you, don't let it be your problem. Let it be their problem. Let it be their problem. God's still the same. God's still good. God hasn't changed. Don't let someone else's failure mess you up. Keep going. Keep going. We look at the next passage, and what do we see in the next passage? They take care of business. Here's a, a pattern for us, and they keep on going. They don't sit around and say, oh, how will we ever get over this? Judas was one of us, and he betrayed us, and, and I can't trust anybody ever again. Uh-huh. Ever thought that? Have you ever heard that? I can't trust Christians anymore because they whatever. Of course we hear things like that. They keep on going. They take care of business and they keep on going. I urge you this morning, if you're holding something in your heart that, oh, you've been hurt or whatever, let it go. Take care of business. Keep on going. Keep on going in the Lord. That's what the disciples do. Amen? Amen. I, I mean it. I don't know. I'm not thinking of any particular person right now. So don't come to me afterwards and say, are you talking about me? I'm talking about all of us. I'm talking about all of us. This is good advice, folks. It's very practical advice. You keep on going. Now, they say we've got to replace Judas. How are they going to replace him? They decide that the replacement must be someone because it's a witness of Jesus. It must be someone who was there from the very beginning. When Jesus was baptized by John in the water, when he came up out of the water, the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. I'm pleased with him. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon him through the very beginning and then saw the resurrected Jesus. In all of their group, there are two people, maybe more, but they feel there are two people that meet these qualifications. They, they meet Joseph called Barsabbas, in other words, Joseph, son of Sabbas, known as Justice, and Matthias. And in their earthly understanding, as they pray, they feel these two are suitable replacements. They are both good choices. How do you choose between two good choices? Here's a question for us, brothers and sisters. No joke. When you're a Christian, You've prayed. There are two good choices. Either one is okay. How do you know what to do? How do you know what to choose? Well, let's look at what they do. And what they do is this. According to all of their understanding, 
This is, these are the choices that they make. And then they look to God and they say something else that is a lesson for you and for me in the very beginning of the church. Because this is for leadership. This is for spiritual ministry in the church. And what do they say? Look very carefully. Their prayer is, Oh Lord, you know all hearts. You know every heart. You know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen. And I want us to see something there. I meet people all along, maybe in Lighthouse, maybe in other churches, and they're all messed up and they're, they're frustrated and they're bitter and they're, well, why, why am I not, why don't I have ministry in the church? Why don't I have a place in the church? Why, I should be doing this. Look at all my qualifications. Look at what I can do. Look at my skills. Look at my talents. Brothers and sisters, skills and talents are not enough in themselves in, in service in the church of God because all ministry is spiritual ministry. And so the other part of the equation, the other part of it is, what about the heart? What about the heart? And God looks at our hearts. Should there be earthly qualifications for ministry? Yes, there should be. That's part of it. God uses that. But God also looks at the heart. And the heart must be right if we are going to serve in God's church because it's spiritual work. It's spiritual work. It's not a company in the world. It's not a business in the world where, oh, the one that has all the best skills, that's the one I choose. That's the one that gets hired for the job. There are physical, external qualifications, but we always have to look at the primary one. Oh, Lord, you know every heart. You know every heart. Show us which one you choose now. How do they choose? Throw dice, in effect. Have you ever done that to choose? You get to? You <laughs> and to decide what you should do? Have you ever done that before when you're trying to choose something God wants you to do? I hope not. <laughs> they do it here. Why do they do it here? First of all, it's something that was done in the Old Testament times. It was an approved method when they were trying to find an important decision. But I want us to see something else here this morning as well. Look at the timing of this. Most Bible scholars say that this was done at this time because the baptism of the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. And Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, what will he do? He will guide you. He will lead you into all truth, okay? He will guide you and lead you. So I urge you, don't go home and get your dice or a die and roll it to decide what the best thing is. Instead, your prayer and mine should be, oh, Holy Spirit, guide me and lead me into all truth. By the way, this is the last time this method of decision-making is ever used in the Bible, okay? Because the Holy Spirit is poured out right after that, amen? I was a little pitiful, but it's still true nevertheless. Okay, so that taken care of, they meet to pray. We read of no other activity than prayer from then on. After this matter of business is taken care of, the book of Acts is a book of prayer. It's mentioned 31 times. So we look at that, sli that next slide again, just as a reminder. Let's look to the next slide. Keep on going. Next slide. They all met together. And we've talked about this part before. They were constantly united in prayer. Brothers and sisters, when important decisions have to be made, especially in a group, may I say one other thing to you about decision making. Unity and prayer are two good environments for good decision making before the Lord. Unity and prayer always when you're, when you're making a decision as a group. And that's the, best, that's the best environment in which to make a decision. And so they start to pray. How long will they have to pray? They don't know, but they begin to pray. And they pray, and they pray, and they pray. Day one, day two, day three, day four. Holy Spirit's not yet given. Day five, day six, day seven. And finally, 10 days after Jesus returned to heaven, a new day dawns. This day in the world is the Feast of Pentecost. It's the most important 
one of the most important Jewish holidays. You can look at the next slide. God gave this holiday all the way back. It's recorded in Exodus. In Exodus, it's called the Feast of Harvest or sometimes the Feast of First Fruits. Oh, there's a lot of symbolism here that we don't have time to get into this morning, but we will get to it in, um, after the anniversary. And then he tells them when to do it. He says, seven days, this is after the Passover, count off seven full weeks. Okay, those of you that are good in math, seven full weeks is how many days? 49, 49. seven times seven, 49, okay? Uh, but that's not 50. Then what else do we do? Keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days later, and the word Pentecost means 50. It means 50, and so there's the, there's the meaning of the word. So the Feast of Pentecost dawns on that 10th day. The disciples don't know that something's going to happen on that day. They're meeting and they're praying. Outside in Jerusalem, what's going on? And if you want to look at your notes, we're, look, we're following along in our notes now. We're right about... We're right about here in the new handout if you're looking. So we're right about there in the new handout. What is happening outside? The streets of Jerusalem are full of pilgrims from around the world that have traveled back to Jerusalem. This is one of the pilgrimage holidays. First one is Passover. The second one is Pentecost. The last one is the Feast of Ingathering. It's the final harvest. And on these three holiday uh, uh, feasts on celebrations, if you were an able-bodied man, you were supposed to come back to Jerusalem and you were to bring an offering of two loaves of bread and you would take it to the temple and you would give it to God. You'd offer it to God on that day. So Jerusalem was full. Mm, do you think God has good timing? I'm pretty sure. And we'll talk about this, this next time. So outside, the streets are full, full of people, fulfilling the religious ritual of the Jewish law on the way to the temple. Inside that room, the 120 believers are waiting on the Lord for the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Will it be this day or not? They don't know, but they're waiting until they receive the gift because they remembered the commands of Jesus, go, stay, and receive. And they've not yet received. They've not yet received. Look at Acts 2.1. And we read in Acts 2.1, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. There's one focus. They're all together. And then something happens. Do you think they're just sitting there chatting and talking? No. They're praying. They're praying. They're praying. They're fervent in their prayers. They're not giving up until they receive the gift that has been promised because God does not lie. God does not lie. God does not lie. God keeps his promise. And then we look at verse 2. Suddenly, what happens? There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Now I want you to look with me very carefully and I want you to look at every word. It's important, the details when we look at it. Is there wind? No, Flora says, she shook her head, kind of, that's right, there's no wind. What is there? The sound of wind, the sound of wind. I was thinking about this yesterday, yesterday as I was preparing. Where I used to live in the U.S. and where mom and dad live now is an area of the country where there are many, many tornadoes. I have seen, in fact, a few years ago in our town, a tornado hit the high school and eight students were killed. This was, this was about six or seven years ago. And it, it's a danger. It's... In, in tornado season, it's a dangerous, it's a, it's dangerous weather. When I was in the sixth grade in P6, we had a tornado warning in our school. It wasn't the first time we'd had them before, but this was the first time that, in my knowledge, it wasn't just in the area. The tornado was headed straight for the school, and I still remember what the teachers did. The teachers very quickly, uh, because the, the, the hallways were on the inside, all the classrooms were on the outside, the teachers very quickly moved all of us to the inside hallways. And we all sat down against the hallways because that, that's where the strongest walls were. And we sat down and we had to cover our face or do this to protect just in case there was any glass or things like that. And because we were on the inside, we couldn't feel the wind, 
But as the tornado came, the sky grew dark, and what all I can tell you is what it sounded like and what I've heard other people say. It sounded like a huge freight train. If you've ever heard a freight train before, not just a it was a, oh, it was a roar that just started, and it grew louder and louder and louder, and you could just feel everything shaking because of the because of the wind, and it was a roar that was so loud you couldn't hear anything else. I couldn't hear the person next to me saying anything. I couldn't hear my classmate, my best friend, crying. I couldn't hear. The only thing I could hear was this roar of a mighty windstorm. And that reminds me a little bit of what, when I read this, it was the sound of a mighty windstorm. The sound of a mighty windstorm. Now, when you look at this, I want us to see one of, a couple other things. How do we know that this is not just a natural phenomenon? How do we know that it's not just something that happens in nature or that it's man-made? There are two things that tell us that. First of all, it's suddenly. It came upon them. It wasn't orchestrated. It wasn't engineered. And where does the sound come from? Where does it come from? From heaven. And this reminds us that the, that the work of the Holy Spirit and the, and the life of the Holy Spirit is from heaven. It's not man-made. It's not of natural origin. It is from God. The Holy Spirit is God. This is the sound from heaven. It was like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. It filled the house where they were sitting. Why wind? Why wind? God could have chosen. Remember, he's God. God could have chosen any sign he wanted to to show the Holy Spirit is being given now. He could have chosen a bright light. He could have chosen water. He could have chosen anything. He chooses wind. This is God's choice. Why does he choose wind? The sound of wind. Oh, go all the way back to Genesis. God made Adam, and what did he do? That's right. He breathed the breath of life. Breath and wind in Hebrew and in Greek, same word. Same word. Then you go forward a little bit. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? The wind blows where it wants to. That's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings life. Remember the evening of the resurrection. Jesus appears in the room and what does he do? He breathes on the disciples and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so as this, this phenomenon, as this sign of the sound of wind fills the room, here is the first sign, the gift of the Holy Spirit. I get excited about this. The gift of the Holy Spirit is being given. And what does it symbolize? What does it symbolize to them? And what does it symbolize to you and to me today as well? It's the wind of the Holy Spirit. It's the life of the Holy Spirit. It's the fresh blowing of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit where he comes, he brings life. He brings life. What type of life he brings? Not human life, not natural life, not so-so life. The Holy Spirit is God life, God life in you and me. Supernatural life, strong life that is stronger than anything in this world that will help you and me overcome what is in this world. It is a powerful life. Oh, brothers and sisters, how you and I, just as the, the disciples on that first giving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, how you and I need the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to flow through and to blow through our lives. You and I, we love God. We're following God. We come to church faithfully. We give our tithes. But how often and when do, how often do we come to the place where we're just tired? We're just dry. We're just stale. Christian life isn't very exciting or something has happened or we've let so much time go on and we're just we just feel like an old crusty like a cactus almost, a, a cactus or something that's drying up. How we need the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to bring life again into our lives. Amen? Amen. We need the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. And so the first sign, the, the sound of the blowing of wind, but that's not the only sign. What's the second sign? That the gift of the Holy Spirit is being given at this moment. Second sign, then what looked like flames or tongues of fire. Was it fire? 
No, because nobody got burned. No, no singe on the top, okay? But it looked like it. And apparently from what this says, it was one and then it separated and it went upon each one. Tongues or flames of fire. Tongues because that's how, that's how we describe the uh, uh, fire, right? It's like tongues of fire, flame of fire. Why fire? And on each one, on some of them, some of them or all of them? All of them, all of them. All of them, brothers and sisters, all of them. And fire comes. Why fire? Why fire? Oh, go all the way back. Moses. And what was, what did he see out there in the wilderness? The burning bush. And who spoke to him from the burning bush? God. God. So they understood that. They were good Jews. They understood. Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's a sign. It's a sign of God's presence. Go forward a little bit. What else do we well, think of something else? As the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, what was one of the ways that God showed his presence with them and God led them through the nighttime hours? In what way? A pillar of fire, a pillar of fire, showing that God's presence was with him. And then the great prophet that laid that, that um, offering on the altar and poured water and poured water and poured water on it and God showed that his sacrifice was acceptable by doing what? Fire from heaven. Fire from heaven. And so when the next sign comes and it's fire, they understood that as well. It's the fire of God. What does fire do? What does fire do? It burns things up. It refines. It makes things pure. That's one of the things. There are other things as well. Brothers and sisters, how you and I need the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The best of us, the best of us, we get so full of ourselves. Believe me, I'm preaching to myself this morning. So if you think, well, you're awfully loud this morning, Pastor Jennifer, I'm talking to me too. I'm talking to me too. We get so full of ourselves. We can be so carnal. We can be so fleshly. We can be so not lovely like Jesus. And the fire of the Holy Spirit when he comes into our lives burns up those things, gets rid of those things, does what we cannot do. I don't know about you, but I know about myself sometimes when I'm sick of myself. And I say, well, I'm not, I don't want to even think that way. I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to talk that way. I'm not going to look, look at those things. And, and we get like this. That has no power to purify me. Only the Holy Spirit can make us clean. Only the Holy Spirit can work in us and purify us and burn up those things that need, that need to be burned up. How we need the fire of the Holy Spirit in our lives. They understood wind. They understood fire. But there was something else. In verse 4, and everyone present, brothers and sisters, a few present, everyone, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, filled a full, satisfying experience with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. It, they didn't make it up. They didn't think up some sounds. They didn't copy somebody else. Just say this, ma, 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 ma. Oh, you've gotten the Holy Spirit. I, I despise that. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And everyone present, don't believe the lie that says, well, this is for some, but not for others. I, I'm sorry. I disagree with that. I don't believe it. I, I truly don't. Don't get angry at me if that's what you feel. Come talk to me afterwards. The example that we see, the picture that we see, everyone, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, later on, I urge you, you go back and read, go forward and read verse 37 and 38. When Peter begins to talk to the crowd, he says, this promise of the Holy Spirit is for you, for your children, for your children's children, and what else? And all, all, all who are far off. I'm far off. I'm 2,000 years later. I'm in Hong Kong, not in Jerusalem. But the promise of the Holy Spirit is for me. The promise of the Holy Spirit is for you. I don't want to discourage you this morning. I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you this morning. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. And now we have a new sign.
sign, something different, something that was not before. Wind they understood, fire they understood, but here was a new sign. And they all spoke in other languages, or as we say, they spoke in tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. It was something new. We won't have time this morning to get into all the symbolism of why the tongue. We will next time. But what I want us to see is this, brothers and sisters, and I want to challenge you and encourage you and make you hungry for more of the Holy Spirit. It is something new. Brothers and sisters, you and I come to church and we live our days with so little expectation. This is life. This is Christian life. This is how church is. This is what, what it will always be. We have no expectation in our heart. But when the Holy Spirit comes, when the Holy Spirit rushes like a mighty wind through our, our lives, when His fire falls upon our lives, and when He comes, He brings something new into our hearts and into our lives that was not there before. It is something we can't imagine. It is something we do not expect. It is something we cannot foretell and say, well, maybe it will be like this. They had no idea this is what God was going to do. It was a new work. It was something new. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and into our lives and we surrender to Him and we let Him be Lord and we receive all that He has for us, the Holy Spirit can do a new work in our lives. A new work in our lives. Do you not want a new work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Something new, something new that has not been there before. What is dead, he can make alive. What is hopeless, he can bring hope. What is closed, he can open. You say, it's impossible, it cannot be. The Holy Spirit can do it. That is what he does in our lives as we say yes to him, as we open our lives and open our hearts to, his, to him. It is his job to do a new work in our hearts and in our lives. I want us to close in prayer this morning. There's so much we could do, but I want us, and I know the time has come to an end. Shall we together just pray this morning and call out to the Lord, each one of us, for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Oh, Holy Spirit, I'll pray, but you pray too. You can, you can pray quietly if you want to. You can pray loudly if you want to. You've been seated for a while. Shall we just stand together? I encourage you, let's just stand this morning as we close in prayer. Oh, God, we come to you this morning. Oh, God, we come to you this morning. Lord, we already know we are your people. We belong to you. We're going to follow you. But God... Oh God, just as surely as the disciples that morning sitting sitting there praying for the baptism of the gift of the whole the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not knowing what it would look like, not knowing everything that the Holy Spirit would do, but just knowing, God, you promised. Jesus, you said you would. Jesus, you said the Father will send the Holy Spirit. Oh, we need you. We need your work in our lives. Holy Spirit, we need your fresh wind to blow through our hearts, to blow through our lives, blow through our lives, blow out the dust Oh, Lord, we're such good Christians on the outside. And, Father, so many of us, if people could see inside, oh, we're just dead and dry and crusty all on the inside. There's, there's so little life inside. We need life. We need your life, oh, Holy Spirit. Come like a fresh wind. Come like a fresh wind into our hearts and in our lives. Oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit. Come as a fire. Come as a fire, come as a fire upon our lives and in our lives, burning up those things that we have tried so hard to control in our own ability, to control in our own power, to, to, to stop doing, to stop saying, to stop thinking, to stop feeling. And Lord, it works for about a day, and then it's back again, because Lord, we can't get rid of it. Oh, Holy Spirit, come into our lives, burn up. Burn up those things. Burn up those things, we pray. We say yes to you, and we surrender to you, and we give you the right, and we give you the honor to come in and do that in our lives. And Holy Spirit, we ask you this morning.
Just as you did a new work, it was a new sign, a new thing in the lives of all those gathered that morning. Oh, do a new work in our lives. Do a new work in our lives. Do a new work in our church, we pray, in our church. Lord, we thank you for Lighthouse. We thank you for the past 25 years. But oh God, that's not enough. That's not enough. That's past. That's past. God, we need you today. We need you tomorrow. We need the fresh wind, the fresh fire, the fresh work of your spirit in our lives and in our church. Every one of us, Lord, I need you. Oh, Lord, I don't want to be the same old pastor that I've been. Lord, I don't want to be the same old Christian that I've been. Lord, I don't want to be the same old whatever that I've been. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, we say yes to you. We say yes to you. We say yes to you. Oh, wind. Oh, fire. Oh, new work of the Holy Spirit. Work in us. Blow through us. Burn us, we pray. Oh, we look to you. Please come and do in us what we cannot do for ourselves. We look to you. Pour expectation in our hearts and in our lives. We look to you. We look to you. Lord, we want to be a church of miracles today, not just 25 years ago. Lord, I want to be a Christian of miracles today. Today, not just 25 years ago. But I can't do it by myself. None of us can. We need you. Hallelujah. Do you remember that chorus, I need you? How I need you. Every hour, every hour, I need you. My one defense, one defense. my righteousness, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need, I need you. I need you. I need you. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need. One defense, my one defense, my righteousness, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. One more time, I need you, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you every hour, every hour. I need my one defense, my one defense, my righteousness, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, my one defense, my one defense, my righteousness, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Lord, we sing it. Lord, we mean it. We need you. Father, I pray that we do not let these words drop to the ground and walk out and say, well, that was a good sermon, and then we go on our way. But Lord, I pray that your words would remain in our hearts and burn like fire that we would come to you today, this evening, tomorrow morning, and just keep coming to you just as the disciples did until you come again and just pour the gift of your Spirit, pour the gift of your Spirit upon your people and your children who need you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.